Good afternoon, everybody. How many, how many people have been to one of my sessions before? Let's see, raise your hands. All right, let's try that again. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the last session of TechEd. Yeah, ever. <laughs> so it's been a good tech ed for everybody? Yeah? Just out of curiosity, how, how, how many people have been to more than five tech eds? How about more than ten? Anybody ten? Anybody here in 2001, Barcelona? Yeah? That was my first tech ed. It's kind of bittersweet to be ending my run at tech eds here back in Barcelona, but a great place to do it. So welcome to the Case of the Unexplained. I'm curious how many people have seen a Case of the Unexplained before session. Oh. So I can't use the same jokes again. <laughs> well, let's get started. Here's the, by the way, how many people have a flight to catch right after this? OK. Is it OK if I run a few minutes over? <laughs> yeah? OK. I might run a few minutes over just because it's so much, I've got so much fun content here to share with you guys. And, if I've got a little bit of slack here at the last session, I'll go ahead and take advantage of it with your permission. The, this is the outline of the presentation today. I'm going to start with a brief introduction for why we're here. How many people have experienced an uh, application crash? <laughs> today. Yeah. Well, then you know why we're here. Uh, most applications, the fact is, do a really pretty poor job of explaining it, what problem they've run into when they run into something unexpected. Developers spend their time working on the, the regular code paths where they load a file or read a registry key, load a DLL, and they spend little time on the cases where there's a permissions problem that prevents them from opening that registry key that the application wants to read its configuration from or from reporting why they can't load the file that's not in the place that the application expected. And this causes the code oftentimes to fall down paths that have never been tested, that have assumptions that have been violated, and that causes the application to do a bunch of strange things, like throw up bizarre error dialog boxes that with completely misleading or useless text, or to crash or to hang. I, I'm sure you've seen your share of bizarre error dialog boxes. I've got a few here, my, some of my favorites, just my three all-time favorite error dialog boxes. There's my number one favorite error dialog box. I experienced this myself. Microsoft out. Unknown error. And the part that's my favorite part of the dialog box is that was this information is helpful. <laughs> This one, I had no idea that processes could be in a zombie state. It's the zombie apocalypse for Visual Studio here. And then the worst error dialog box of all time. <laughs> and then this one, uh, somebody just emailed me right before the comp. Yeah, there we go. This one is fresh here from here in Barcelona, just a few days old. This is a, a Visual Studio plugin of some kind crashing. And so hits right close to home. So we're, the reason we're here is to, look, to learn about some tools and techniques that will help you look beneath the surface of these kinds of error dialog boxes and problems to understand what might have led to them so that you, when you understand the root cause, then maybe you can come up with a solution or come up with a workaround and get past the problem and hopefully that it won't recur again. And the tools that we're going to use, of course, are a bunch of the sys internals tools. The sys internals tools, for those of you, I'm not sure everybody in here probably has a good idea of the sys internals tools. Tools that I started authoring back in 1996 with a friend of mine, Bryce Cogswell. Bryce retired from Microsoft in 2010. I continue to author to the tools myself. It's a hobby of mine. I still continue to do. It's just a fun way to, to share with the community and to write some cool stuff. And there's now a few other people that have contributed to some of the tools. I'll mention some of them and some of the tool names that I've got. But for the most part, Sys Internals is still me doing basically this just for a lot of fun and sharing it with you guys. There's another tool that we're going to use in here that's not a Sys Internals tool. It's called the, the Win Debug Windows Debugger or WinDBG. It's part of the debugging tools for Windows. You can see the download locations for both of these. 
Also, not mentioned on this slide, and in case you weren't aware, that you can run the Sysinternals tools right off of the Sysinternals website at live.sysinternals.com slash tools and the tool name, so you don't even have to go download a zip file. You can execute it off a web dev share sitting right up on, basically, on the cloud. If you're interested in really understanding the tools and deeply knowing about their functionality and their techniques that I'm, I'm just going to skim the surface on today, this is the official reference book on Sysinternals. I co-authored it with Aaron Margosis. You can see my name is the biggest name, although he did most of the writing for this book. Um, and he finally convinced me to let his name go on the cover for that. And I, th I think that was just a fair thing to do at this point. The book has chapters on all, it covers every single tool on the site as of a couple years ago when the book came out and including major chapters on the major tools including, uh, like Process Monitor, Process Explorer, and Auto Run. So I recommend you check that out. Let's go ahead and get started with uh, some scenarios. You can see I've broken it up into symptoms here. And the first category is sluggish performance. We'll start with a real case that somebody sent me where the, their system would suddenly get sluggish and the cursor would start to flash. You know with the flashing wait cursor, but it would flash back and forth between waiting, not waiting, really quickly. So they knew something was going on in the background that was causing the system to get sluggish. The first thing they did was open the event log. And this is something that most systems administrators at this point are well trained to do when something's gone wrong in a system. Go look at the event log, see if there's any errors that are in there that could explain what happened. And what they found in the event log, you can see here, they opened up the application part of the event log and they came across an error here and an application error, and the application error was that the faulting application was search protocol host.exe. I'm sure you guys have seen search protocol, search protocol host busy on your systems. They're chewing through updates to files in your inboxes so that search can work on the desktop. But the question was, in a situation like this, this is a built-in Windows component, if this is a problem with Windows itself, you're kind of out of luck. You've got to wait until Microsoft releases a fix for it. But there might be an off chance that the bug is something that, that this application is triggering on some bad configuration someplace in the operating system. So maybe there's a permissions problem that's causing search protocol host to fail. Or maybe there's a third party component that's loaded into the process that's causing it to go berserk. And it's not really the process itself. It's not search protocol.exe. So we need to look beneath the surface to see if it's one of the, these kinds of cases. And that's exactly what this person did. The tool they used to take a look at what was going on was Process Explorer. How many people have used Process Explorer? And I'm going to just make you raise your hand all afternoon just to keep you awake here at the end of TechEd. How many people have never used it just out of curiosity? Never used Process Explorer? Never anybody? Good. I think I got 100% coverage for the first time ever. Did anybody raise their hand? Yell out if you haven't. Oh, there's one person way back in the back there. You're excused now. <laughs> Let's just take a quick look at Process Explorer. This is the, the view. You're all familiar with it. Obviously, you've run it. The big difference between this and Task Manager on first blush is the tree relationship you see, the tree structure, which shows you the parent-child relationship of these processes. Any process that's indented and beneath another process is a child process. Any process that's completely left justified, like this win in it process, has a parent process that is terminated. Or it's the initial system process, like this one, which has no parent by definition. The other big difference that you see between this and process, uh, between task manager, is some extra information that's shown by default, a description and company name. This information and the icon of the executable, this information is all pulled from the version resources of the executable. So it's what a developer puts into it. It's not any kind of built-in database. You can see columns for CPU, virtual memory, and working set usage of the processes. If you want to see well, one of the, the cool features of Process Explorer is that it does a lot of the same functionality. In fact, it's a big superset of the functionality that Task Manager's got built into it. So what people often do, including me, is replace Task Manager. And the way that you can replace Task Manager is go to Options and say Replace Task Manager. And once you've done that, now Process Explorer has become the official Task Manager in the operating system. So if you do, what's your favorite way to launch Task Manager? 
Control Shift Escape, that's like the cool way to do it. Uh, that's the way I do it. Control Shift Escape, and there you go. I'll show you a little bit later exactly how that trick works using another SysInternals tool. By the way, here's the, the new task manager coming out in Windows 10. It hasn't been released yet. Some of the other features here, you can look at system information uh, here by d clicking on one of these graphs. So this is a CPU history, here's a memory history, I.O. These graphs have tool tips that will show you the process that's been consuming the most of that resource at the point in time represented by the mouse over the graph. So you can see that Link has been doing a little bit of network I.O. in the background as I, I've been doing this presentation. There's a, some new features in Process Explorer. I'll take a, well, actually, why don't I, I take a look at some of the other deep, deep features that you see here. Uh, and I'll talk about the colors first. The colors are another difference between this and Task Manager. One of the colors that you'll see a lot of here in the display always is blue. Another one is pink. And those of you that came to my session yesterday, you know that the blue processes are the processes that are boy processes, right? Just, and the pink ones are the girl processes. No, really, the blue ones are the ones running in the same context as me. The pink ones are the ones that are hosting Windows services. If you want to take a deeper look at a process, you double click and you see a lot of different pages of information, starting with this image page. It shows you basic information about the executable and how it ran, what time it ran, whether DEP is on and ASLR. Then you have various tabs that show you performance of the process across a bunch of different categories. You've got performance graphs. So these are mini history graphs, again, with the same kind of tooltip hover that will show you the values at points in time. Disk and network activity, including the, the delta. So if this thing is executing I.O. to the network or disk, you can see it, this update in real time. If the process is using the GPU, direct 2D or direct X or direct write, you will see information here about its GPU usage. So you can see Explorer's using some CPU, some GPU. The threads in the process, the network connections it's got open, UDP and TCP, the process token, so these are the privileges assigned to that process with the token that was assigned to it at the time the process was created, which is generally a to uh, representation or a copy of what you were given with, at the time you logged on, if it happens to be one of your processes, and the groups that you, your account belongs to. You can see I belong to a lot of random groups at Microsoft. Then the environment variables. And a lot of times processes refer to these things to find information about the system or their own configuration. And then finally strings, which I showed in the malware talk yesterday, so it lets you look at the printable strings inside of the image. There's some new features that have been added over the past nine months or so. One of them is run automatically at log on. So in the past, you'd have to, man if you wanted Process Explorer to always be running, Where'd it go? Process Explorer. If you wanted Process Explorer always to be running, okay. <laughs> uh, that's not something I deserve applause for. I don't know. <laughs> it's got to be a network problem. <laughs> oh, you know what we'll do? I'll show you this. Uh, prompt dump H. Okay, I'll tell you what I just did in a second, but let me go ahead and restart that. I don't know what happened there. Start this up again. I promise that's never, ever, ever happened before. <laughs> uh, so some of the features that I was going to show you this uh, run at logon up here. And that what that does is run Process Explorer automatically. One of the things that you'd have to do in the past if you wanted to always run, which I always have it running in my, down in the tray area, was to create a scheduled task or put it in the run key. And if you put it in the run key, then it wouldn't run elevated or you get a, a UAC prompt. What this does now, if you've run Process Explorer elevated, it will create an elevated task automatically. So when you log on, it's automatically sitting there running with admin rights. 
The other, a couple of the other things that now shows you WMI provider hosts. Let me explain what that is. For these hosting processes, ones that contain other components that are designed to host other things. Service host process, for example. Run DLL is another example of a hosting process. Process Explorer will show you in the tooltip not just the basic information about the process, like the command line and path, which it will show you for every process, but for one of these hosting processes, like a service host, it will show you what services are hosted within it, what components are hosted within it. And then what I've added recently is for WMI provider processes, we'll show you the WMI providers that are hosted within each of these instances. They're designed to encapsulate and isolate WMI providers so that they don't interfere with each other and they could sit and run in their own processes. So that's an, a new thing. And then DPI has become really important now, support for DPI as these res the screens have gotten higher and higher resolution and you know you need to make the font size bigger. Applications need to support high DPI and that DPI awareness is now built into Process Explorer as a column that you can look at. A biggest feature that I've added in the last 12 months or so, nine months, is integration with VirusTotal. VirusTotal is an online antivirus scanning service and you enable it in Process Explorer by going to the VirusTotal.com menu item here and saying check VirusTotal.com. When that's checked, you can open an executable here and see it will automatically check whether any of the, whether any of the antivirus engines have flagged this thing as potentially malicious. And if you're looking for malware, then you should add the virus total column to the display and it will show you uh, the scan results for all of the images that are shown. If one is unknown, meaning it hasn't been scanned before, you can submit it to virus total for scanning on demand. And you can see that uh, this one's got one, it's shown in red because one engine has flagged this thing as malicious. And see here in a second, it is this antivirus engine right here has flagged this thing as a Trojan. So I'm, I had no idea that this thing was uh, malware and that all these other antivirus engines are so lame they didn't detect it as malware. And so what I'm going to have to do now is clean my system after, right after the presentation. I'm just kidding. Obviously this is a false positive. This is one of the unfortunate behaviors of antiviruses, heuristics that are a little too aggressive. Let's get back to this case now. In this random sluggishness, he opened Process Explorer and just to take a look at what was going on and saw a lot of flashing green and red. That's another one of the highlight colors in Process Explorer that will show you when a process is being born and when it's terminating. Something that task manager, it's very hard to see because it's just basically a flat list of processes. In Process Explorer, a new process will show up in green. Let's create a new process here. And you can see some green show up there and when I terminate it, It'll turn red because that process is no longer part of the display. And that's exactly what he saw when he opened Process Explorer. He saw search protocol hosts coming and going, obviously crashing and then restarting and then crashing and restarting. So he configured to see if he could capture a dump. He couldn't actually, you know, in this case you can't attach a debugger because the process is so short lived. How do you capture a crash dump of it? Well, you saw me do that a little bit earlier with a sysinternals tool called proc dump. How many people have used proc dump before? A few of you have used ProcDump. ProcDump is a tool that not only generates dumps, but generate, generates dumps based on a, a whole slew of different triggers. You can see that the, the command line options for the number of triggers have just become overwhelming almost in the, uh, because of the, all the flexibility and the things that you can have it do. For example, you, one of the common cases in the first use case that I had for this was just to point it at a process like I did a little bit earlier and just say create a d crash dump of this. But another, the, the real power in this comes with the triggers. So one of the triggers you can apply is, for example, CPU usage. How many of you have ever had a, a server that spikes in CPU periodically, but you don't know what's causing the spike? And you wish you could get a, a crash dump at the time, you can't sit around with the debugger and be there ready to go. That was the original use case for process proc dump. Many of the tools and features are motivated by internal Microsoft support asking me or telling me that there's a gap in our utilities and lo looking to see if I could fill them or, if, or one of the tools already does. In this case, it was exchange support. Exchange servers would periodically spike. They wouldn't be able to analyze what was going on because the spikes were short-lived and they asked 
if I had a tool? And I said, no, I don't, but that sounds like an awesome tool, and that's, thus was born ProcDump. Let me show you the CPU spike trigger in action. So if I say ProcDump-C, and I say I want to capture that a dump if the process consumes more than 25% of the total CPU, let me launch a process that consumes, that I can make consume CPU, a little old NT resource kit tool called CPU stress. And what this will do now is when, is monitor the process usage of CPU stress, and when it ab rises above the threshold, it starts a countdown timer. By default, the, thre the hung threshold is 10 seconds, but that's something you can configure. And you can see once it hit that 10 seconds, it generated a dump. You can see I configured it by default. It only generate one dump. But what you can do is also say, if it spikes the CPU for more than five seconds, generate a dump. And for every five seconds that it continues to do that, generate other dump. So that way you can get periodic snapshots. That's one example, but it supports things like being able to create a crash dump based on memory usage if it uses too much commit. But even better, and again added at the request of the exchange server engineers, you can give it an arbitrary perfmon counter with a threshold and say create a dump if this perfmon counter, whether it's a system perfmon counter or a process perfmon counter, if it goes above or below the threshold, then generate a dump. So it's really a universal trigger thing. Oh, by the way, there was another one, dash H, which I which I used actually in that previous dump, this is the hung window dump. If the window frosts like we saw, it becomes unresponsive to user input, this will generate a dump. And guess what product team asked me for that? You'll never guess. No, it's not interactive. Outlook, yeah. The Outlook team asked me for that one. No surprise there, right? So this, user generated a crash dump and then they opened it up. Let's go open that crash dump and take a look at what they did. But now first, let me set the stage here. This tool is the debugging tool for Windows, Win debugger, Windows Debugger tool. You can download it as part of the SDK. The first thing you want to do when you get this is to configure the symbol path. And this, it should really just configure it automatically to point at this by default. This points at the Microsoft public symbol server. So any of the Windows and Microsoft binaries that this looks at, it'll go and automatically download the symbols and place them in the directory you specified. You can see I put them in public symbols and then process them there. And what that enables is you to see intelligent call stacks. I'll show you what a call stack is in a second, but you'll see function names, the ones that the developers gave the functions. And that can, just the names themselves can give you an idea of what the DLL or process is doing at the time of a crash and could point you at a root cause. So that's the first thing you want to do. What I'm doing is opening this first, this uh, crash that this person sent me. And at this point, what you want to do is have the debugger do the work for you. There's a built-in crash analysis engine that uses heuristics to try to pinpoint the root cause of a crash. And you can invoke it by saying bang analyze dash V. And this will then go and process the heuristics. It's trying to load additional symbols for the DLLs that it sees in this crash dump. And then it prints out the call stack of the faulting thread. This call stack, the way that you read it, and we're going to see call stacks a few more times in this presentation, is that this function in NTDLL, this name before this exclamation point is the DLL, this name afterwards is the function name, calls this function in this DLL, which called a function in this base thread in it in kernel 32, called into search protocol host, called into mappy h, old mappy 32, and then finally got to here. And this is where the crash took place right here, referencing some invalid address. The culprit in most of these cases is that last DLL, the one that's on the top. It's the one that was executing at the time of the crash. And in fact, if we look at the debugger engine's output, it says probable cause, this right here it has a nice hyperlink there. You click on that, it will show you it, the information that it's got about it. You can see in this case, it's a third party DLL. It's not from Microsoft because actually that's not a surprise because Microsoft software is never the cause of any of these kinds of things. <laughs> and it's from this third party semantic. And what this user saw immediately said, wait a minute, Enterprise Vault, that's a, 
backup utility that we used to have on this server, on this uh, system server a long time ago, we don't have it anymore. We don't use it. So I, I can basically go and uninstall it. There's no reason for this thing to be interfering with me. So they uninstalled the thing and the problem went away. The search protocol host was fixed. So recapping, process explorer looking at the search protocol host, proc dump to catch a dump of it and then the Windows debugging tools point pinpointing the fact that it was a third party DLL inside this Windows component ca actually causing the problem led them to a, a root cause and workaround or solution. This next case was sent to me by somebody that was very unhappy with their Windows purchasing experience. They went and bought this very nice, big, bulky laptop because they're a heavy movie watcher. They watch movies with their wife a lot and they wanted a really nice laptop to take with them various places and watch these movies, these Blu-ray movies on. So he gets his big, shiny new laptop and he start, put, pops in a Blu-ray DVD and a couple minutes into the playback, the picture starts to stutter, the picture and the sound. And then it stops stuttering and plays for a few minutes and then another two or three minutes later, bam, stutters again. So he's thinking, oh, you know, this is ridiculous. I spent all this money on this. Maybe there's something wrong with the DVD player. So they went to the, the DVD, they, first of all, they were using a third party DVD player software. They went and saw if there was an update for it, no update. Maybe it's the DVD player. Let's go take a look at that. They go take a look at the, ver the device manager to see what DVD hardware they've got. It's an HP DVD player. They look on the web, no scattered issues, but nothing that quite matches the behavior they were seeing. And there was no firmware update available, so it wasn't, didn't look like there was a known hardware problem with this particular brand, uh, version of the Blu-ray player. At this point, they start to get desperate. What is causing this stuttering? So for that, they turn to a tool called Process Monitor. How many people have run Process Monitor before? How many people have never run Process Monitor before? Anybody? I guess it was just that guy that I made leave back there. He's the only guy. Process Monitor, let's take a quick look at Process Monitor. So Process Monitor, you fire it up. I've already got rid of a couple of default columns, the timestamp and the sequence number just because we don't really need them for this presentation. But this is the basic information that you'll see. The process name in the left column, the operation that the process is performing, the path or the target of the operation. So if it's a registry query, you'll see the pa registry path. If it's the file system operation, you'll see the file system path. If it's a network operation, you'll see network addresses. The result of the operation, so the status code that came back from the operation. And then finally, in the last column, detailed information about the operation. This process monitor, I try to capture uh, as much detailed as information as I can that makes sense without overwhelming the amount of data captured. Enough information that almost all problems should be solvable just by going back and looking at the trace and, not, and looking at this kind of detailed information. For example, here in the create process call here, you can see that there's a ton of information here. The desired access. So when you get an access denied, you can go back and look at this and say what access did the process need? In this case, it would be read access instead of write access. So I could add read permission for that process because I've looked at this particular piece of information. You can see if it's a create file, a create file is an overloaded function call. A process can call create file just to open a file or to create a new file or to create a file, a new file if the file doesn't exist but open the existing one if it does and that's what this disposition is. So this kind of level of detail captured in that trace. Further, if you want to look at all of the information captured for an event, you can just double click on it and this is all the information. All of this can be added in the columns, in the column selector, all of these uh, pieces of information can be added. So you can, if you want uh, to see any particular piece of information not shown by default, you can easily add it to the main list view just by adding it to the column list. And then the process tab will show you information about the process. Very similar to what we saw in Process Explorer the path to the process, the command line used to launch the process, the process ID, parent process ID, what time it started, the list of DLLs loaded into the process at the time that the process, at the time of this operation. And this is useful because if the process had a DLL problem, a lot of processes uh, load and unload DLLs. If you want to see a great example of it, 
Notepad. Let's take a look at Notepad. In fact, I'll show you the DLL view in Process Explorer to show you processes opening and closing DL DLLs. The bottom view of, pro of Process Explorer, which I didn't show you earlier, shows you the DLLs loaded in a similar way to what Process Monitor shows you. And it also has color highlighting. So when I do control O in Notepad to open a file, that on demand pulls in a whole bunch of Explorer DLLs that will show us the nice shell experience. And you can see a bunch of green, all of those DLLs and metadata files pulled in just because of that file open command. And when I close it, some of them get unloaded. You saw some red there. So that's a, whoops, quick look at, at the DLL view and the DLLs. But process monitor will show you the DLLs that were loaded at this point in time. If a DLL was later loaded, you wouldn't see in here. And if a DLL was unloaded, you would see it in this event, but not a later event. And finally, the stack. Well, I'll come back to the stack because we're going to use it in a real case in a few minutes. But the key to using process, process monitor is to use uh, filtering efficiently. And there's a whole ton of fil uh, filtering techniques to become acquainted with if you want to get the most out of process monitor. The most powerful, the one that I use the most, is simply right clicking. So, if, for example, I just want to see accesses to dev env. I can pop, pop open this quick menu, quick filter menu here, and I can say include that, exclude that, highlight it, or copy that component of the display to the, the clipboard. So if I include it, there I've just now seen only accesses to that. And then I can say, well, I only want to see accesses to that that are create files. So I can make a compound filter like this. If I want that information that I filtered out to come back, I just simply type control R and that undoes the filter. That's the simple quick way. If you want more complex filtering, and one of the things that I want to often do is I say, oh, you know, this, this directory is what I'm interested in. Any accesses to the IDE directory, not just DevEnv. And in the past, you'd have to open the filter dialog box, copy that in, or and add include filter, and then go and open the filter dialog box. Now, this is a relatively new feature. You can say edit filter. And that opens the filter dialog box with this in the edit fields of the filter dialog box. Path is this. And so if I just want to see things that are in that directory, I can say path begins with that. Add and then say OK. And now I would see any other accesses to that directory, not just that particular image. So that's another filtering tip. And then the final filtering tip that I want to share with you, another one that I use quite frequently, is I'm interested in a particular process. It's not, it's not visible right here. Let, let's say I want to see what, here, I'll just do something, dir. I want to see command prompt. I want to see its activity. I could go fill, searching through here or, or do a, uh, through scrolling or I could do a control F search for it, but a lot faster is to open the process tree view. The process tree shows me all the processes that existed at any point during the capture including the ones that are running now, as well as ones that have already exited. The ones that have exited you can see show up in this dark gray in their lifetime and are grayed out. But then I can go down and find command.exe, which is right there, and say include process. Oh, I don't know why. Oh, it's because I, wasn't, I didn't have monitoring on. So now that I've included just that process, if I do a dir, then I just see that process now. And I was able to find it very quickly. So those are the quick filtering tips. Let's get back to this case now. They open, let's go open the trace that they captured. And stuttering Blu-ray. Here's the trace. You can see they were using Power DVD. You can see the DVD players at drive letter G. You can see the movie file there being streamed. There's a lot of stuff going on. He scrolled through this. What could be causing the stutter and then a little, about two minutes into the trace, he starts to see another process show up. WMI provider service and you see it accessing the G drive and it looks like it's just doing 
a directory listing of what's on the G drive and those directory listings are interleaved with the playback of the power DVD player. It looks like we have our culprit here. The WMI provider process is hitting the DVD player causing it to seek while the DVD player software is trying to stream the movie and causing this jittering. What it was enabling, what is causing that WMI tracing? WMI provider process, especially the built-in Windows SIM providers are triggered remotely by a WMI client. Question is what is, what client process was triggering this WMI activity? So for that he went to Event Viewer and in Event Viewer you can turn on, this is, a, uh, you can find information about this online by searching TechNet, how to turn on WMI tracing. And that's what he did to find out what did it. You show, you go here to view in the WMI activity event log and you say show analytics and debug logs and then you enable trace log. That's what he did and then he reproduced the problem and he found this in the event viewer. After he reproduced it that uh, there's an operation here, root sim v2, select star from win32 DVD drum, uh, CD-ROM, so that's the full directory listing you see there. The client process ID is 1940. What's client process ID 1940? He went to Process Explorer, 1940, it's this blue solel cs.exe. What is that? From IVT Corporation. And you can tell just from here that it's some Bluetooth stack software. What business does Bluetooth stack software have to be reading the Blu-ray player? I don't know, maybe the developer just wants to look at anything with the word blue in it because they wrote something with Blu-ray or Bluetooth and so they're doing that. But really there's no legitimate reason. They stop the, the service just to be sure. Problem goes away. They were able to stream successfully. They went to the vendor, vendor website. There was a new version there. They downloaded it. After the install, that was no longer doing any WMI queries and DVD playback was smooth. So went from bizarre stuttering problem, used process monitor, then was able to go and identify the root cause of this problem that had basically made, ruined his experience with this very expensive laptop. Problem solved. So uh, this is another case solved with process monitor. By the way, like 90 percent of the cases I get are solved with process monitor. Dave Solomon, my co-author on Windows Internals, you, if you've come to this session before, know that he came up with an expression a few years ago because it would solve cases that you would have, you'd be basically think, have, wouldn't cross your mind that process monitor would solve them. So he came up with an expression, when in doubt, run process monitor. And that's what I, one of the big takeaways from this session is for you to learn when in doubt, run process monitor. And to help us drive that home, I like to have us all say that out loud <laughs> together. And this will help us stay awake through the afternoon too. So let's see, on a count of three, let's try it. Let's see if you can do it the best of any tech out audience in Europe this year. One, two, three, when in doubt, run process monitor. That wasn't, that was actually pretty good for the first time. We're going to do that about ten more times and then we'll see if you get better. All right, this next case is uh, from somebody that worked at a church and they'd set up, uh, they have this basic daycare at the church. Kids get checked in and whenever they check in at the, the check-in desks, they get printed out a badge that the kid wears around and to keep track of the child and make sure that they don't leave without anybody knowing. And, and what happened was they got a bunch of uh, printers, eight new printers, and they found that when they were printing these badges that six of the printers were really slow and two of the printers were fast. As in really slow, like they would take a minute or two minutes to print the badges when the other one, the, the fast ones would just take a few seconds. All of the printers are exactly the same. Behavior is re consistent regardless of they have a bunch of check-in disks. No matter which check-in disk they used to hit the printers, the same two printers are fast, the rest are slow. So they captured a pro uh, process monitor traces from the client systems, from a client system printing to the two printers. Let's go load those in and compare what they found. So slow printers. And this is one of the most pop powerful techniques. If you have a situation that reproduces on one system but not the other. Comparing traces side by side is a great way to narrow down to the root cause. 
And the trick to this is to try to find something to align the two logs together. The way that I usually do this is I look for the shapes. I don't, I'm not reading the individual paths. In fact, there will usually be some differences based on the environment. So you don't want to just do syntactic equivalency comparisons. You want to just look for functional comparison. And so you can see the shape of these two traces that I have side by side at this point are roughly ex the same. They've got the same kind of in and out indentation. Down to about here. And then there's a, a difference that they noticed on this trace. On the good side, they saw a little bit further down a divergence. So you can see this client side printer rendering port over here and you can see that the trace looks a little bit different over on the other side. And they looked and the, on the, the fast printer, on the, the, when the client was printing to the fast printer, they see it writing this to the local registry. This is the name of that fast printer. On the print to the slow printer, they see so, no such write to the local registry. And these writes are coming from the spooler process. Let's go over here. It's this local spooler. So what they did, they said, hmm, that's an interesting string. I wonder where it's coming from. So they went to the print server of the fast printer and they went to the registry and they did a search for that string and found it. They went back to the slow printer print server. They did a search for a similar string with the same name of the printer. They didn't find it. So just wondering if that might be the cause, they created a, a regedit file that they imported into all the print servers that had that string filled out for it that matched the fast printer. So they applied this to the other six slow print servers or the six slow printers and retried the print. Print was fast. Problem solved. Process monitor showing them that this key that showed up on a client side of a print server was the trick to making the print and why those other printers didn't have this key set for them, this value set for them, a mystery. But at this point, you know, it's like, okay, I got the problem solved. Time to move on and spend life doing something more productive and that's exactly what they did. So problem solved with a, just a few minutes, a process monitor, a side by side trace. Really powerful technique. Let's take a look at error messages now. This one, a user upgraded their Windows 8 system to Windows 8.1 and every time after they upgraded they saw three error dialog boxes pop up on the log after, right during the login process. This is from a friend of mine that lives in South America. You can see that the error messages are in Spanish and I thought it would be appropriate here in Spain to read these for you. Problema al enseñar, C colon slash P R O, see, I'm really good at Spanish. So what did they do here? They turned, they wondered what was activating this thing. How many people use MS config to look for auto starts? And this is going to pain me, I'm sure, because some people are going to raise their hands. MS config, and you raise your hand like you're proud of it, that's not good. <laughs> How many people use auto runs instead? There's much, that makes me feel better. Auto runs is a, a utility that will show you all auto start locations that generally that are, are people in the civilized world are aware of at this point. I've just done a scan of my system and I set a filter on this. I've changed the defaults to show you all of the auto start entries that are configured on my system right here. What's shown in blue, those blue lines are the auto start entry locations. So you would find HQ local machine software Microsoft current Windows current version run there as one example of blue. What I've done is said in the filter options which are available here is include empty locations. And that means that all of these locations are potential places where uh, software can be configured to auto start, just ha doesn't happen to be used on my system. And there's lots of solid blue you can see where there's nothing configured. I just wanted to give you an idea, there's literally hundreds of places where auto runs knows to look. And it divides up into categories. You can see there's about 16 different categories here of different auto start locations. For every image that is configured, it will show you description, publisher, image path, timestamp down here, information about the auto start entry. So this is the class ID of this com object, the DLL. You can delete the entry, you can copy it, you can jump to the entry where it's configured in the registry. You can 
search online for it. You can look at the properties of the image here. But the way that you want to typically do this if you're hunting down a problem is to say hide Microsoft entries and verify code signatures. Verify code signatures if you're looking for malware, not necessarily really if you're just looking for a problem. But once you do this kind of scan, this will only show you the code that's not from Microsoft. Again, not that Microsoft is perfect, but most cases this third party software that's causing the problem that you're probably looking for and this will show you the, uh, those third party code and the code that's unsigned. The pink lines are ones that are not digitally signed. And I don't know why some of the software in Windows 10 is not digitally signed like this one, for example, but, oh, that's a, a development kit process, uh, executable that's, I've installed a development kit, so that's why that's not signed. Pink processes, uh, pink lines are ones where the file is missing. So you can see file not found here. And then you can see timestamp. It's also, I've just added integration with Fires Total that will be coming out probably next week. But that's a quick look of auto runs. What this person did was take a look at auto runs. And let me pull that up for you. So run deal all errors. And they scrolled through here and they found three different references under the task scheduler for this DLL right here, sysmenu.dll. And you can see yellow, file not found. There's one, two, and a little bit further down, three. Corresponding to exactly the three pop-ups that they saw during login. What was that file? What is the missing file? They did a search online. And they found that uh, there's an article online there that if you click on it, it says that this thing is potentially unwanted software. Pull that up real quick. Uh, where is it? Here. Nope. Where is, uh, oh, here we go. So this is a context menu handler by Gubzu. This has been detected by Animauer. So somehow this thing had gotten removed from the system, maybe through the upgrade process. The Windows upgrade had ripped it out with uh, anti-malware, but hadn't fixed the references to it, which is causing these pop-ups that they didn't like to see. And so auto runs took them right to the, the cause. This next one is one that somebody sent me. They were, they had a, were using Media Center on Windows 8, and they went to update to Windows 8.1. Windows 8.1 update, you go to the store, you get the Windows 8.1 update, it downloads Windows 8.1, you see a, a progress bar, and depending on how fast your download link is, it can take anywhere between 15 minutes and 45 minutes or so to download the Windows 8.1 update and apply it. What they found is they let that operation go and they came back a few hours later and the progress bar was still at 10%. But it was moving at a rate that seemed like it would be fat, take, be done faster than the few hours that they'd waited before coming back. So they sat and watched for a little bit, and they saw that when the progress bar got to 50%, it would just, bam, reset and go back to zero. And then come back, 50%, bam, get reset and go back to zero. So what the heck is going on? Oh, and by the way, they got an S error dialog box. Your Windows 8 install couldn't be completed. This is one of my favorite error messages, too. Something happened. Very technical explanation. So the, they tried rebooting, they tr tried searching online, they couldn't find a, an answer. The first thing they did was go take a look at the installer log. So the installer log, here's the Windows Update installer log, and they searched, and they came to this section right here. You see Windows Setup Install, Start. And then they, you see installer completed, process return code 802.4.201c. Sound looks like an error message, and here's the end of the install. And they saw this repeated in the log file for every one of those failed attempts to install. So what is causing this 802.4.2.1c? They decided to turn to process monitor and capture a trace of the install with process monitor. This trace 
of the install, which takes a long time. There's a lot of activity on the background of the system. You can see there's 61,000 events in this trace. What is the root cause? One of the key ways to try to find what is the, the root cause, one of the most common types of problems that result in an application failure is a permissions problem or some other generally obscure error on an operation that uh, impacts the, the application. And the way that you can see what errors occurred in the trace is to go to the tools menu. The tools menu has this d feature down here, count occurrences. And it will work across any of the attributes that are captured on any of the events. You can count the number of unique occurrences of, the pro of a process name or a path. What we're going to do and what this person did was look at the unique occurrences of results types in the trace. So they click on result and you say count. And you see that there's a bunch of different error codes in here, but the notorious access denied, there's four of them. Where are these access denieds and what's causing them? You can apply a quick filter here just by double clicking. And I've just applied an access denied filter to the results and you see that there's a create file attempt from setup host of Microsoft Crypto RSA machine keys, some GUID, and then access denied. So just on a whim, they went and edited the permissions on that key to give ad administrators full access. Administrators didn't have full access, they only had read access on that, that sorry, that file, that directory at the time of the, the problem. They added full access, retried the install, went all the way to 100 percent success. So they posted this in a, in a forum and you can see when they posted it, a bunch of other people, it turns out, had the same problem. Here install a Windows 8 preview fails over and over and there's a bunch of people, here's this, this user that told me, that, that sent this case to me, says here's how do you, well actually here's the Microsoft support answer. It's like, it, d uh, disable your antivirus. Yeah, that's a good uh, tip right there. And then, you know, retry it again and um, make sure that your system is um, free of any other errors. <laughs> yeah, standard Microsoft uh, forum support there. No, I'm just, actually, <laughs> we try to be more helpful than that, but in this case it was, we don't really know and so, yeah, good luck. And so this, <laughs> This person posts in here, yeah, I figured it out. Look, I figured it out using Procmon, figured out this thing. And then this person, you know, people are like, oh, I have the same problem. That's awesome. Thank you. Wow. Very cool. And so problem solved with process monitor. And then, of course, Microsoft watching this forum reports the problem to the product team and they fix it. So another case solved with process monitor. This next case is one where a uh, Windows installer package, so an uh, IT administrator is trying to install a uh, package onto a server 2008 R2 system and the install would fail on this one particular server but on other servers would install successfully. Sounds like a great case for process monitor and side by side comparison. So that's exact, well actually before they went to that they of course check MSI verbose logging because maybe that has the answer to it and you can see that in the verbose log this error shows up. Perform type lib failed with error code 11 and function code this. And they translate that function code and there's a little tool that's part of the, of, uh, part of the SDK called ERR and if you enter that, it says type E registry access. So something related to the registry, something related to type library registration in the registry. That's the clue that they got out of this MSI log. At that point, they need to pull out the big guns. They pull out process monitor, like I said, do a side-by-side -side trace. Failed, failing system, good system, and do a side-by-side -side comparison. Let's pull up those logs. So installer failure. Here's the failing one. I'll put it over on the left. And the sick working one, let's go put that on the right.
And what I'm doing, I just pressed F6 in both of these traces to take me to the heart of the problem because there's a lot of information here and what this person did is again follow the whole, you can see that these flows right here that I've got in view, roughly the same. And then when they, once they got to this point, they noticed that things started to diverge a little bit. Let's take a, a look at how they diverge. They look kind of the same, but then this one goes off into looking at helpter and this one in the, the failing side doesn't. So something around here is potentially the clue to what the difference between the behaviors is. This F6, you can see that those lines are bolded and that F6 took me right to the bolded lines. That's a feature of process monitor I call bookmarking. You can enable bookmarks in a trace simply by typing control B and that's what I do when I've got a case like this when I want to get back to a certain place, type control B and then you can see it's bolded and now that is part of the trace. I can take this trace now and send it to somebody else and say, I think the problem is somewhere around where I've set a bookmark. The person gets the trace, they press F6 and they get taken right to that bookmark place or in the case of me doing a demo like this, I just press F6 and I get taken right to that place. So what, there's nothing obvious though when they go took a look at the registry references here between the two traces other than the fact that they diverge a little bit. So at this point, they said, hmm, need to take a, a deeper look. Maybe, maybe there's something inside the installer that is causing the difference in the behavior. Maybe there's a third party component loaded into one of the, in the failing process that's causing that behavior. I mentioned that you can look at the stack of an operation, stack trace that led to an operation by double clicking on it and then going to the stack tab. And that's what this person did. And uh, if you take a look at the two side by side, let me pull them closer together. Does anybody notice what the difference is between these two? Somebody said it. AC general shows up in this trace. You see fast here at this MSI, there's different temp files, expect different names on them. Olayout32 calls them to register type lib, which matches the MSI installer error that we saw in the log file. Then that calls fast create key, but then on the working side, we see this call into this DLL. Anybody know what this DLL is? It's the Windows App Compat DLL. You can see that just by double clicking and looking at the version properties right inside of the trace. So that was a clue. Something related to AppCompat. App, some AppCompat shim appeared to be enabling the installer to work on the working systems that maybe it was, and it was somehow missing on the failing system. Why was it not enabled on the failing system? So they said, well, maybe it's not configured. Maybe there's something in the trace that will tell me. Here, let me pull up that trace back again. So they searched for AppCompat. And uh, this, the, what's fascinating about these kinds of cases is that if I was confronted with them, I'm not sure I would follow these same steps. I'm not sure I would say, oh, I'm going to search the trace for AppCompat just because there was an AppCompat shim in one and not the other. But that's what makes these cases so cool is that everybody kind of is inspired in a different way, triggers a different thing. It's just piecing together clues, trial and error, going and taking a look at things. They came across this, HK Software Policies Microsoft App Compat, not as uh, a file not found. They kept searching. And then they came across this one. This one right here. They see a reg open key of Windows App Compat and then a query value of Windows App Compat disable engine and the result is one. That's the value of that key, that, that's the value of that value, on the failing system. Somehow, for some reason, that had been set to one to disable app compat. So they went into the registry, set the value to zero, retried the installer, and it worked. So a few clues, side by side tracing, a hint in the stack, leads them to this. It's one of the cooler cases that I've seen because it's a several layers deep and it 
it's based on a little bit of intuition, a little bit of art to re lead the administrator to the root cause. So pretty cool case. Let's try saying that again. You want to practice? I think I've shown you some cool cases that are worthy of another practice of our favorite slogan for the afternoon. Let's try. One, two, three. When in doubt, run process monitor. All right, that was okay, I guess. I'll give you a passing grade on that one. Let's talk uh, about buggy behavior. This one is a case that's just a few weeks old, sent to me by a Link support engineer. One of their customer, one of a Microsoft customer, calls in and says that after they installed the August 2014 cumulative update for Link 2013, that they, the Link server reports that diagnostics are unavailable. It looks like the logging services of Link are disabled after they install this update. Something's broken. Of course, they turn to the event log and take a look at what's in the event log. And they find this. Exception, could not load file or assembly. Microsoft RTC CLS agent IAS log. Why is this deal out? Why is this assembly missing? Where's this, where's Link server trying to even find this assembly? Is it present on a working system? Again, a great case to do a side-by-side -side trace. So here's the failing system, and here's the working system, and I'm going to search for CLS for IAS log. On both sides. And I'm going to do an edit to say if it includes RTC client IS log. So path contains. I'll copy this to clipboard so I can add it to the other side. Say OK. And then do this on this side. And say path and contains. Oh, it didn't copy for some reason. Uh, IS log. Is that the right one? No, that's not it. Here we go. Edit. And say path contains IS log. And we can see that the traces look very different. On the right side, which is the working system, we see lots of hits to a particular place. It's in Microsoft.net, assembly GAC MSIL, and the file sitting right there in the, the GAC. And on the failing side, you can see the logging system probing and looking for this thing in a bunch of different places, but getting path not found. So including the place that we just saw it, find it on the working system. So somehow this assembly was deleted from the system after this update was applied. The support engineer copied the assembly from the working system to the failing system, re tried to restart the link server, and the diagnostics law agent, the diagnostic service, was able to start successfully at that point. So what was the problem? They reported this to the link product team, and a few, about a week later, the product team, the other people, by the way, they saw were having this problem. The product team found out that if you installed this cumulative update after you installed this other security fix in that order, that it caused this assembly to get deleted for some reason. And so they released a fix for the update that would cause it to not delete that assembly. And that, you can see this is just from a a few weeks ago. So another case solved with process monitor, side-by-side -side tracing, looking at the difference, clue from event log, so piecing together different event sources. That brings me to the final section of the presentation, the blue screen section. I thought we'd just skip it this year because I don't think anybody's experiencing these things anymore. And so, right? 
Uh, certainly it's fixed in Windows 10. There's no more blue screens in Windows 10. Right? Anybody experienced a Windows 10 blue screen? Uh-oh, one. I guess it's not quite, we haven't quite fixed it yet. How many people have experienced a blue screen ever? <laughs> the last year, the last six months, the last week, the last day? Anybody today? Anybody experience one today? Yeah, one? Yeah. Okay, I guess we will do this section after all. Uh, but one I wanted to share with you, if you've come to my sessions before, you've seen I've shared, a, I've got a blue screen of death collection that I like to share. So I'd like to show you the latest version of my collection, the, the highlights. I've got a folder that's got hundreds of, of pictures. Unfortunately, they're not too hard to come by. In fact, people send me this, you know, pictures of, of, built, of various kinds of, you know, the most common type of blue screen is Heathrow gates, gates at Heathrow uh, at the, at the gates, those boards are always crashing with blue screen. So I've got a collection of like 20 of those, including my own that I've collected there. So don't send me any of those anymore. But let me show you some of the others that I've collected. And some of you might have seen some of these before. Some of them are just so priceless that it, it's worth keeping them for the people that haven't seen them. Like this one at SeaTac's baggage claim, where this guy, I don't think his luggage is ever going to come out at this point. <laughs> This is at DFW. That's a nice kind of multi-paned blue screen there in the hallway at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. This, not really a blue screen, it is a, a Windows update. <laughs> this is... <laughs> I mean, what are the odds that the text is just going to line up like that perfectly? <laughs> This is uh, eight, uh, the ticket vending machine at the New York subway system. I heard somebody told me that they were going to upgrade these things because this picture is like a year and a half old. And then I found out from somebody that was there a few months ago that it's still these same old clunky things running Windows NT4. Whoever took this picture was sitting there watching it and then saw it blue screen. <laughs> uh, this one's a giant billboard on the side of the road. DHL, this shipping kiosk. Train station, anybody recognize this one? I think it's Milan, but I'm not sure. CompUSA's bestseller. This was a classic <laughs> CompUSA. If you're not aware, some people in here might not have ever heard of CompUSA. It was a big you know, retailer in the United States that went out of business because they were selling PCs like this. <laughs> this is Best Buy selling similar PCs. <laughs> this is uh, an you know, when I first got this, I laughed, and then somebody at one of these tech ed, last tech ed here, I showed it for the first time at Tech Ed Europe last year, and they came up and said, actually, I was at this concert. This is a techno guy that, I can't remember his name, that, actually, that puts up blue screens as part of his act. So it's become cool in, I guess, the techno circle. This is, again, a classic. This is Dave Solomon. If you haven't seen him or know about him, he's the, my co-author in Windows Internals, wrote a lot of the Windows Internals t sessions that we used to do together at TechEd before he retired. This is him traveling with his wife at the airport, at the gate, seeing the blue screen, looking at it, analyzing it, and then telling the people in the waiting area what the cause is. <laughs> There's a Halloween blue screen treat for you at Dunkin' Donuts, flight information, blue, destination blue screen, <laughs> a blue screen that you can walk on. This one, again, an all-time classic. This is a gas pump that's blue screened. And here's the root cause. <laughs> what makes this really funny is that this is an actual picture from the Building 26 parking lot at Microsoft. And I have to make the oblique. <laughs> I made this obligatory joke. That is the task manager developer's car. <laughs> this is, well, I experienced this in a conference room a few weeks ago. This is an oldie, <laughs> but feel sorry for the person that was told by tech support to write down the error message and fax it in. <laughs> This 
This is on a gas station uh, pump in Europe. <laughs> this is in Ukraine at a mall. The kitty care, blue screen of death, will be taking care of your child. This <laughs> was sent to me by somebody in this room. This uh, is in Ukraine at an uh, ATM machine, and you're not, your eyes are not deceiving you. That is MS Paint there <laughs> with the la word scrawled on it, ATM out of service. And <laughs> yes, they do things. It's one, it's one of my all-time favorites of all. <laughs> this is at a mall. Anybody recognize that? They have very interesting uh, destinations on the subway. Microsoft conference room, upside down, blue screens. Now playing in Nashville, blue screens. This is from a month ago, so I don't, I don't think they've gotten the XP uh, end of life message. This one is again a classic, the, probably the most how many people watched the open ceremony of the Beijing Olympics? About a billion people. And a billion people got to see a blue screen on the top of the dome there, the bird's nest dome. This is walking into Olympic Park in uh, UK during the last Olympics there. At Paddington Station, telephone blue screen, burger blue screen, uh, air traffic control tower in Ukraine. <laughs> It's actually not that's Independence Square. But, uh, health station, blue screen. Uh, TV reporter reporting on blue screens. <laughs> my daughter, I got this uh, email from my daughter. This came up on my computer at school. Ha ha. <laughs> and when she got home, I sat her down. I said, that is not funny. <laughs> and I hope you fixed it. And she said no, so I sent her off to do her process monitor labs. <laughs> uh, Walmart station, Wendy's. I mean, you can say this is an oldie but good, oldie but goodie if you're familiar with the Iraq War. And then we're back to beginning. Oh, and then I've got one last one that's just priceless too, a relatively new one. This, um, it turns out there's this cool Connect app. Oh, we've got to watch the ad first. Um, let me set this up. There's a, do you want to watch the ad? That's kind of interesting. Uh, there's this cool uh, Connect app we're going to see in here in a second. It, it's a sandbox app. So there's a Connect camera above the sandbox, and kids can play in the sandbox. And depending on the height of the sand, it'll project down different colors. And so you can create these 3D kind of topological things. So you can see uh, here the kid. There's a kid playing in the sandbox. Wait, is this the one? Somehow it switched videos. That's not the right one. Oh, here it is. A kid playing in the sandbox. Now the interesting, and you look, you can make a, like a volcano looking effect. That's all projected light, but it makes a cool effect. And then, uh, but this is really gonna traumatize the kid, I think, because watch what happens. Oh. <laughs> All right, so let's get back to our, our case. This case was sent to me by somebody uh, that was reading a news group and saw somebody complaining about a, a blue screen on their system. They said, I'm having a BSOD, attempting to switch from BDPC. I've attached the mini dumps. Can anybody help? So the person that sent me this case, being a helpful person on this news group, said, sure, I can uh, take a look. And so they, they open up the crash dump file. And here's what they saw. So the way that you analyze a crash dump, again, with debugging tools for Windows, that's all you need. The same thing that we've been using earlier. And you go to, uh, you go and, whoops, you go and open the crash dump file. And by the way, where do you get the crash dump file? The place to check is in the mini dump store, Windows mini dumps. That's where you're going to find crash dump files. Unless you've configured your system to take a kernel, uh, create, I don't like saying take a kernel dump or take a dump, but you <laughs> configure, unless you've configured it to generate a, a larger dump, then it's going to be in the Windows directory and in memory.dump. So just the full dump or the kernel dump, that's the, has the most information. So 
That's the one you want to load if it's available. Otherwise, go into the mini dump directory, and that's what this person had posted, these small files. And again, just simply analyze dash V. So what, what was the cause of this crash? If you look at the stack, a uh, driver called my fault ended up crashing. Anybody heard of my fault? My fault is a tool that I've wrote just for, well, here, wait. Not my fault. That you can use to generate a crash dump. And I did it for uh, illustrative purposes. So it's in Windows internals, there's a section on crash dumps and it uses this. You can see it generates lots of different kinds of crashes that also leak memory and do a bunch of other things. And that driver that's part of it, you can see is called my fault. So the cause of this crash looks like self-inflicted wound to, <laughs> to me. And so this person writes back into the forum, they're like, well, we're, they're like, uh, yeah, are you using Not My Fault by Mark Rusinovich? If so, please stop and remove it. <laughs> it's supposed to cause BSODs. And the person writes back and says, yeah, yeah, I'm not stupid. It still crashes on hibernation. It's true that I used Not My Fault once, but I've uh, attached the new dumps. So let's go take a look at the new crash dump that they sent. And we'll do the bang analyze dash V. And in this case, again, if you take a look at the tr stack trace, this thing is calling uh, K uh, delay execution thread. The, remember the if you're paying attention, I mentioned that the uh, crash cause was a DPC timeout error. DPCs are kernel mode functions, and if they take too long, the system will crash because it's likely a bug in the driver. And the driver that was executing the DPC that was taking too long was this EMS7KS. Question is, what is this thing? If you click on this, not many times, especially in mini dumps, you won't find version information, so no description, company name, no other hints about what this was. So they search online for this and come up with this, that it's a, a, S, a M MMC card reader driver. Windows includes built-in drivers for these kinds of devices when you get a laptop from an OEM. So they uninstall the driver, and now after that point, their system was able to hibernate successfully. So just a couple minutes with Windabug and bang analyze dash V, points them at the root cause of the driver, they uninstall it, and their system is able to hibernate successfully. So a successful case with, and I recommend that you take a look. If your systems are crashing, by the way, they're configured to reboot on crash. So what you should be doing is looking at the event logs of your systems in your network, if you manage a network, to look to see if your servers are crashing. There's been cases where after people have come to the case and explained, they've gone back and found that they've had servers on the networks that are periodically crashing. They had no idea until they went and looked. And then a couple minutes in Windabug, and they're able to find the solution like we just said. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. I want to show you one of the cool features coming in Windows 10. It's not released yet. And that is, we've heard so many people love the start menu that we're adding the start menu to the blue screen of death. <laughs> and and I, th I know this makes some people go, wait, huh, what, wait, if you're crashed, what does that, bit? no, it doesn't make any sense. What makes sense is sharing the blue screen with your friends. <laughs> and so that brings me to the conclusion. Now, I, I hope you enjoyed the session. Hope you were entertained a little bit. Got some cool techniques and familiarity with some of the tools on how you can troubleshoot problems that you might run into. Please check out the other resources. I've got lots of cases and explains that I've already done. All have different cases. These, the ones in this presentation are all new to this presentation, so you can go back and look at the other ones, different tools, different techniques. Please, if you run into a case and you solve it, send me screenshots, send me log files so I can add them and share with other people. And I want to leave you one last thing. Let's say it together. When in doubt, run process monitor. I hope you had an awesome tech ed. I hope that there's a, I'll see you another whatever we call the conference next year here in Europe and I, there better be one or else I'm going to be really mad. 
And so have a great trip home and see you next year. Thanks.